everyone. My name is Matt, and I am a Navy vet. A, I have an undergraduate in international affairs at George Washington University, and I'm working on my master's in history at George Washington University. And today I'm talking to you about what I like to call the Potemkin Paradise, uh, the United S Federation of Planets in the 24th century. So why am I speaking about this with you today? Well, the Federation of the Next Generation Era was held up as an aspirational ideal for us. Uh, you know, so much so that probably not a month goes by where I don't see in social media somewhere someone going, well, we could have had Star Trek, but instead we got, you know, Elysium or Warhammer or Mad Max. Um, and why wouldn't you want to live in the Federation? It provides itself on rule of law. Sapient rights, Chekhov would say human rights, uh, humanitarian ideals in line and foreign policy, and on a post-scarcity society. The problem arises, you know, that the Federation maybe not as it maybe is not as perfect as some people think. Federation foreign policy was realist in nature, while domestically they frequently failed to measure up to their ideals. Now, I'm going to lead with foreign policy and start with some key foreign policy assumptions, and then I'm going to go into some failings that they had domestically, in part due to these uh, foreign policy of the Federation. So, some key foreign policy assumptions. First off, the Federation is frequently portrayed as a top dog, dog in the Alpha Quadrant. I'm not counting, like, uh, the Travelers or the Organians. But, but in large part due to the technological advantages they may have held over the other uh, major nations. Second, in general, the foreign policy uh, strove to be both idealistic and rational, not necessarily realist. And this is manifested through the prime directive and also great effort being made to avoid conflict, usually at all costs. So let's start, start with this top dog thing. The Federation was always a near appeal to the Klingon Empire rather than the other way around. Uh, this is borne out by the performance of the Klingon Defense Force and the various Federation Klingon conflicts. I, I'm including the uh, hypothetical ones and yesterday's Enterprise. In addition, the KDF was very successful in other conflicts. For example, they quickly overran the Cardassian Union. They hanged on in a defensive war by themselves against the Dominion Expeditionary Force. And, and so we can kind of see that maybe Federation techno technical advantages would not translate into an overwhelming military advantage against the Klingons. Now, Federation policymakers kind of realized this. Uh, they seized upon the opportunity of a weakened Klingon Empire after the Praxis disaster to get them on board with an arms control agreement. And this arms control agreement is kind of what drove the 24th century Pax Federation. They even managed to convince the third, the number three Romulans to a degree to agree to an arms control treaty uh, through the uh, Treaty of Kellon. Once you had a resurgent Klingon Empire, you know, almost a century later that had recovered from the crisis, uh, from the disaster, under the expansionist Galwan regime, and they repudiated the Kittimer Accord system. The Federation found a, a real crisis. They had trouble fighting, you know, against, you know, these allegedly, you know, less sophisticated, less technologically advanced, you know, less economically powerful uh, countries, which is pretty good indication that the Federation was never, you know, the superpower, was never the first amongst equals. So what about the foreign policy in general? Well, the prime directive is often taught, brought up as something that's idealistic and Leiden. Uh, I, I believe it was mostly used as an excuse not to make policy decisions. It, it wasn't consistently followed enough to be an actual policy. You know, the best example, of course, would be the Federation operating Deep Space Nine for the Bajorans uh, in the name of the Federation candidacy period for Bajor. Second, the UFP routinely violated the territory of other bodies, you know, where they uh, sent a deep recon mission into the Dominion to look for the Founders' homeworld after being told, hey, stay on your side of the wormhole. 
you know, that, that is something that probably ticked all the boxes for the paranoid founders. And finally, when the Federation took the conference avoidance route, it was Federation citizens who suffered. And this is, as you should be able to tell, this is mostly focused on the more marginal colonial wards of the Federation. So on the left, we have a Tolarian and a human teenager. The human teenager uh, was born a Federation citizen. His parents were killed when the Tolarians attacked and, and leveled this colony. He was adopted as a Tolarian. This is just kind of like a prominent example of something that happened fairly frequently. A fourth rate power would bomb a Federation colony or colonies. There would be a short border war, and then there would be peace. Uh, this is not unique or limited to the Tolarians. To the right, we have Picard telling the citizens of Dorvan 5, Hey guys, got to pack up and go. There's been a treaty. There's a land swap. You had no input on this. Uh, this is now called Ashton Territory. You, you gotta go. Uh, th this is kind of the most prominent uh, of these wars where this happened. And in fact, it was extremely common along the Cardassian uh, demilitarized zone. There were several wars where they had a land swap and the, and the locals were not given any input. The, 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 ounce, the desires of the citizens on these wards where the post-scarcity society did not exist. Uh, were not taken into account by the Federation. And so, what, ha what what's the result of that? Well, the official, the semi-official uh, Federation policy of treating marginal wards as second-class citizens led to those citizens taking matters into their own hands. This is kind of best, uh, the best example of this would be the Marquis. I'm sure all of you are familiar with them. They were the group of colonists along the Cardassian border, who fought against Cardassians. You may recall the Cardassian government was funneling troops to their own colonists. And these policies led directly to widespread sympathy and extremism in Starfleet's ranks. And, you know, we, we saw no fewer than five commissioned officers in Starfleet uh, out, out and out join the Marquis. Of course, you have Thomas Reichel. Will Leland, Cal Hudson, Michael Eddington, and Tom Paris. So you had this widespread extremism directly as a result of this poor, you know, uh, foreign policy. So what other domestic problems that the Federation had? Well, I already talked about, you know, this post-scarcity society did not really exist on these colonial wards. We also saw widespread use of the military, or at least militarized law enforcement against civilians. To the left we have some citizens on, I believe it is, Volon 3, uh, kind of backing away as Starfleet has arrived to lay down a law because they think uh, that the Marquis are using this as a base. It's worth mentioning that at this point that in the next generation era, it's the next generation Deep Space Nine, Deep Space Nine and Voyager, I don't think we see a Federation civilian law enforcement officer ever. You know, we may see a planetary one somewhere, but we don't see someone from the Federation. Uh, th there was no Federation marshal. There was no Federation Bureau of Investigation. In addition to chasing around ships, Starfleet apparently lands on colonies and makes arrest or, you know, shakes people, shakes uh, uh, people down for it. Jadzia Dax on Riza after you have those extreme after you have those troublemakers trying to control the weather even says oh we can arrest them we're a Starfleet so what about law enforcement what about uh, the judicial system well to the right we have Admiral Bennett no real Admiral Bennett I should say he's a with the Starfleet Judge, Ad, Judge Advocate General Corps and there he is uh, get, rendering a sentence to Richard Bashir, who is Julian Bashir's father. Now, uh, you can, Richard Bashir was a civilian. Um, while Bashir was in the military, uh, you, you know, it, it's hard to see how, how a military judge can go after a civilian. You know, you can kind of wrap this up into a national security concern with arguments. I, I don't buy it. 
you know, generally speaking, in a free and democratic society, the military does not render judgments or sen or execute sentences against civilians. But that's just me. So what are the uh, conclusions we can draw from this? Well, one, trees will buy you peace, but you better have a backup plan if the other guy decides they don't want to participate in it anymore. Two, no matter how enlightened you think you are, realist policies will always trump idealistic ones. Three, no matter how egalitarian the military out there is, we will still extre see extremism in the ranks. You know, it, it isn't anything to kind of just pretend doesn't exist. Keep an eye out for it. Four, again, no matter how egalitarian a society is, military forces, military law enforcement, military judicial system over civilians is not in keeping with egalitarian uh, democratic ideals. Now, you may think that the takeaway from this is that the Federation is a bad place to live. Bad place to live. It isn't. But the lesson I'm trying to impart is that don't be so blind about how good a society is that we ignore or downplay the bad parts. Because if we do that, you know, we're going to create it into something it isn't. So my name's uh, Matt Booker. Thank you for listening and live long and possible.